Good afternoon. My name is Jason Darnell, and I am a teacher and chair of the history department at Linear Middle School in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm very passionate about innovative, uh, sorry, innovative, interactive uh, instruction for history classes. So today I'd like to present my current. I'm sorry. Today I'd like to discuss the ominous outcomes of our current philosophy on how to teach history, and then present my vision of how history should be taught in the future. Uh, the motivation behind this talk comes from a recent study I came across from the University of Connecticut's uh, Department of Public Policy entitled The Coming Crisis in Citizenship, Higher Education's Failure to Teach America's History and Institutions. This particular study surveyed 14,000 randomly selected college uh, freshmen and seniors from 50 schools nationwide to determine what colleges and universities were teaching their students about America's history and political institutions. The results, which represent the largest of its kind to date, concluded that the typical college graduate now knows just enough about America to bomb a basic multiple choice civics test with an abysmal average score of 53.2 on a traditional grading scale. scale excuse me. To make matters worse, even after finishing four years of college, graduating seniors only knew slightly more about American history than their freshman counterparts. At the prestigious Yale University, after finishing four years of college, graduating seniors actually knew less than the incoming freshmen, a frightening phenomenon appropriately entitled negative learning. This eye-opening University of Connecticut study clearly identifies a serious pedagogical problem. American students know far too little about history. What's more, over time, that lack of historical understanding will in fact pose a real risk to our republic and its political institutions, which depend on a well-informed citizenry to function properly. It seems that our democracy is at stake. So how do we turn this around? How can we motivate students to become more motive, I'm sorry, more actively engaged in learning history? Well, it begins, I think, with a remodel. History class's own revolution, so to speak. Today, too much time in history class is dedicated to the expert, to absolutism, things being good and bad, or right and wrong. And too much time is spent on technical data that's quickly forgotten. So what would this revolution look like? I think it needs to follow three principles of, inst of effective instruction. Principle one, students need tools. In the future, history teachers should pass on the tools of their trade, just as students uh, receive in other core content classes. For example, in science class, a student can learn about a specific phenomenon and then is given the tools such as the methods of science to then carry out an authentic experiment in which they're learning, I'm sorry, in which that said phenomenon is recreated. These tools allow students to actively participate in their learning and more importantly, enable these students to discover knowledge independently. In math class, students are given geometric formulas. They're given algebraic orders of operation that they can use to carry out and to solve everyday mathematical dilemmas and are essential in fields such as chemistry or engineering or accounting. Do educators of history today pass on tools to their students? In the future, I think history teachers should pass on the following tools. How to evaluate primary source documents for reliable historical data. How to recognize and understand the uses of propaganda. And most importantly, how to record and document history. Now I know the textbook has been in the news recently, but I'm here to say in the future, the textbook will not be the headquarters of expertise in the classroom. If the preceding historical method is introduced and put into practice, students can write their own history. The textbook will be used in the classroom no longer as a great book of knowledge, but simply a text that needs some serious revisions. Principle two, students need connections. Let's take a quick survey. I need you to raise your hand if you've ever participated in a real war. Now I need you to raise your hand if you ever plan on participating in a real war. Now I need you to raise your hand if you've ever created or appreciated a piece of art. 
need more. Raise your hand if you've ever fallen in love. Raise your hand if you've ever broken something and then scrambled to put that something back together so the owner of that something would never find out. <laughs> As you can see, by the results of our quick survey, that most of you, much like my students, have neither participated in a war nor plan on it. While the vast majority of you raised your hand when I mentioned activities that define us as human. History teachers need to remember that we teach a humanity, the history of humanity. Yet, there's not very much that we're required to teach that's humane. You see, why should we let the actions of so few dictate and write the history for so many? Why should we let political leaders, military leaders, and wars dictate the scope and sequence of our curriculum when our students have no connection? You see, so far, history has been written by the powerful people of previous epochs. People like the Pharaoh, the Caesar, the President. In fact, until recently, history was a traditional top-down discipline in which greater attention was paid to the grand giants of history than the everyday people who lived and shared in their world. As a result, names like Ramses, Julius Caesar, and Abraham Lincoln are familiar ones, and their life stories have become the stuff of legend. All the while, the unwritten history of people from the past has been unknown and lost and largely forgotten. In the future, History should be taught as a total of its constituent parts. And since civilizations were created by the many members of society, a people's history must tell the tale in total by focusing on pharaohs and families, Caesars and citizens, presidents and people, in equal measure. Therefore, the traditional scope and sequence of all history classes needs to be torn down and rebuilt with a primary focus on people and society a pe um, excuse me, and multiple points of view rather than what it is now, which is a sprinkling of multicultural personalities within a backdrop of empire and nationalistic mythology. When the story of Columbus is told from the Arawak point of view, or when the story of westward expansion is told from Chief Joseph's point of view, or even the story of the Texas Revolution, told from the Mexican point of view. The stories become much more powerful. No longer are students required to identify with oppressors from the past. Instead, you hear students speak of tolerance, open-mindedness, and learn that they are intended and not so intended consequences for their actions. Principle three. Students need to play games. In my opinion, American students need the practice when it comes to history and government. Today, the way of teaching history is way too passive, and students rarely, if ever, get a chance to participate in the political institutions that make up our republic. Excuse me. Therefore, in the future, I think all history classes should have an interactive game layer injected into instruction. Currently at Lanier Middle School, we have a program called Historia that meets that criteria. In Historia, students are immediately placed in the center of activity by participating in a fictional government in order to care for fictional citizens' needs and protect them from the real events mandated by state curricula, such as disease, encroaching empire, or even revolution from within. History is used for world culture and world history classes and covers 4,000 years of history separated into 15 epochs. As I said earlier, students in collaborative groups make decisions to care for and protect fictional citizens. But the way each group makes decisions is based on the form of government they've chosen. Let's take a look at the governments at students' disposal. As you can see, each civilization begins with a tribal chieftain, the most primitive form of government. The student with the highest average in his or her group becomes the tribal chieftain, mirroring how a tribal chieftain would be, uh, would be selected in the past for wisdom. Through successful decision-making, civilizations can then earn points to rise up through this pillar of government. 
You can see after Tribal Chieftain, there's the monarch, and the student that is the oldest in that group becomes the monarch, and then rules according to the rules of a monarchy. Um, after that, they can go in four different directions. They can become a dictatorship, which is the tallest student in the group, becomes the leader, and then rules uh, according to those uh, policy. Fascism, of course, we have a quick arm wrestling tournament at their group to see who the strongest is. And then they become the fascist leader, modeling how fascists rule. Uh, we have direct democracy, of course, which everyone will have a vote. Oligarchy is the student with the most money in their pocket that day is the oligarch. For aristocracy, it's the three students with the most money in their pocket that day. Um, of course, they move all the way up. And of course, the goal here for any government is justice for all. Uh, if the student chooses to, if the student group chooses to have a constitutional monarchy, well, then they're going to receive a Magna Carta. If they receive, uh, if they choose a constitutional democracy, well, of course, that group will have a constitution. The students are participating in governments according to the rules that, that those governments follow. Um, Next, to prepare for their civilization's potential rise and fall, students are first assigned to research the impending era on their own, causing them to learn curriculum with a mission in mind, to make wise, group-wide decisions and grow their civilization into a strong and successful one, from the ground up, despite what history has in store. And speaking of what history has in store, during the epoch 1900 to 1950, Student governments could have one of these events become part of their very own civilization's history. Here's the first. Of course, it's a positive one, and this is Marie Curie's discovery of radiation. A local woman named Marie Curie rises to prominence in your civilization because of her many contributions to science. Curie's experiments with radioactive elements lead to the discovery of alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, earning her the Nobel Prize in both physics and chemistry. Curie's impressive accomplishments make her your most famous of citizens. Reap the rewards. So you see the students will get points for that. But if they had prepared correctly, they would have had a periodic table in their civilization's history, and you will actually receive the full benefit if, you, if your civilization is advanced that far enough in science and technology. And if you are, you, your civilization receives the discovery of radiation. Uh, negative. Francisco Franco in the Spanish Civil War. When a local military man named Francisco Franco launches an attack against your government, your country is violently split in two. As civil war spreads throughout your civilization, hundreds of thousands of your citizens are killed in the conflict. When Franco's fascist faction gains the upper hand, your government is overthrown, ushering in a new era of harsh right-wing rule that puts, your limits, puts limits on your people's freedom. Well, of course, this is a negative one. They're receiving negative five points. If they had studied beforehand and known that this was a possibility, they might have, they might have achieved the Bill of Rights, and the, the effect might have been less on their uh, civilization. Um, there are unintended consequences of the Spanish Civil War. You get a masterpiece from Pablo Picasso, La Guerra, and of course, there are the intended consequences. Uh, your government needs to change, because there was a dictator that just took over your, your civilization. So then they will uh, have to choose their government and then run their government according to the rules of a dictatorship. Um, the best thing about Historia is that it encourages students to research, analyze, and judge history from multiple perspectives. Much like a trained historian would do, students become the architects of their own learning and understanding of, and of the history in the world around them. Games can influence, I'm sorry, games can influence students' behavior. I've seen it. It's a simple fact. And if the games are created correctly, designed correctly, they can influence students' behavior in a positive way. A game will make a student seek out knowledge on his or her own initiative. A game will increase the amount of work a student turns in. A game will increase the amount of times that student participates in class. I've seen it. In conclusion, simply put, History class should teach the human experience through the human experience. And in so doing, elevate the education of our citizenry regarding our nation's history, thus curing our republic of this coming crisis in citizenship and hopefully leading to a brighter future. Thank you very much.